And this is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. Here's a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. John announced, Someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Lesson New Begin, um, when he was returning from his 20 plus mission work in India, uh, came to Birmingham, England, his, the place where he grew, and had a great culture shock. I would imagine maybe somewhat similar to when I had gone back to uh, Korea, uh, Kimpo Airport, landed there. I was uh, 22 years old, and over there there were signs that says, Korean and foreigners, where do I line up? Now, it wasn't because uh, he had become a thorough Indian uh, coming to England wearing uh, sarong and, and craving curry. He, when he was in India, he immersed himself in the culture. He mastered the Tamil language, which was a headache to many Westerners. Uh, he even wrote a Bible study in Tamil, and it was so good that they translated back into English his primary language. Uh, but he came back to the West with a great love for the Western culture he grew up in. He didn't come back anti-Western. He came back with suit and tie. But because he, was, he loved the Western culture, he paid close attention to it. And he said that the greatest missionary crisis today is in the Western world. The greatest missionary crisis in the Western world. England has an official church, Anglican church. Western, European, and American included. It's a Christian nation, isn't it? Founded by Christian fathers. And yet he found that as many churches as there were in England and all around in the Western world, uh, people were not confident about the gospel. In South East India, where there were less churches and he did not have any government to support, people were confident about the gospel. And yet in here, people were unsure. He said this was the great missionary crisis. Don't you feel that too sometimes? Are you confident in sharing about the gospel? Aren't most of us kind of worried, a little scared? Uh, Almost like we're not trying to spread good news, but we're spreading some type of virus. And we don't know exactly how to proclaim this message. Another way to say this is this. uh, How do we proclaim the gospel in a pluralist society? Um, That's how Newbegin put it. And that's what I want to study with you today. And next week, about how can we proclaim the gospel in a pluralist society. Um, That's how the Western world has become. And in this pluralist society, we become very uh, afraid, worried, anxious about sharing the gospel. Okay, so today and next week, um, I... I pray that this will really inspire us. Uh, it will help us to become more confident in the communication of the gospel. Um, and, but there's going to be a lot of uh, 
theology and study of, of sociology, so put your thinking cap on, okay, and follow along. All right, the first thing we have to do is this. Uh, we have to distinguish between a pluralist society as a way a society is organized and a pluralist ideology. Those are different. So as a society, pluralist society as a way of organizing society, it basically means uh, no one should be coerced to believe a certain way. And in that society organization, right, uh, we Christians should welcome it, honor it, and defend it. This is part of, actually, the image of God in us. And God created us. And God gave us freedom. This thing is a little, am I getting stronger and more muscular? <laughs> God gave us freedom. And God gave us freedom because we studied this last week. The only way we can love is when we can have the freedom to love. When we can choose not to love is when we can truly choose to love. And that's why we say beings, right? Fishes don't love us. They don't have any freedom. And dogs somewhat love us, but they don't really have freedom. You feed us, and they're happy to see us. Human beings can love us because the human beings can choose not to love us. So marriage, we propose marriage. We don't demand marriage. And so there's freedom, which is part of the image of God. And so to say that we live in a society that organizes itself where the, we are not coerced to a certain way of believing, uh, well, that's part of protecting the image of God that we have. We should be free. And of course, a whole American historical also uh, background is that uh, Christians moved to America not to seek a se total separation from free, uh, state and uh, religion, so then there should be no religion at all, but that they will be free to practice their religion. So freedom from coercion of what to believe in how to love God, uh, that's theologically sound, and historically, uh, it's also sound, and so it's something that we should welcome, honor, and defend. No problem with that. But it's the second thing, which is quite uh, dangerous, pluralism as an ideology. Now, pluralism as an ideology says that all religions should have their say, Okay, sounds like that's pretty good, respectful, because what religion says has no truth claim. It is basically just expressing one's own uh, cultural upbringing, uh, one's own need uh, to feel uh, some transcendental experience in this world. And you are, you know, have your own right, and she has her own right. Uh, what they say doesn't have any true claim, so let them just say and express their passion. You can say whatever you want as long as you don't try to convert and say this is the truth. That's pluralism as an ideology. It's kind of like you know, baseball game or a football game. You have your team, and that's great, but no one's going to say this is the ultimate truth. Right? Everyone likes their team because of where they grew up. I like Mets because they grew up in New York. Simple as that sometimes. Now, this is very dangerous because it seems to say that, okay, look, we cannot know the truth. There's no such thing as universal truth, so everybody has their uh, right to say that what they believe in, and let's just all kind of respect each other. But in saying that, the pluralist ideology says, actually, there is one fundamental universal truth in which all these other religious experiences can have their play. They seem to say there is no ultimate truth, but actually they're imposing an ultimate truth. And that's where it gets dangerous. Uh, the poster parable for uh, pluralism's ideology is that parable of a king who calls four blind men, and there's an elephant, and everybody's told to uh, feel an elephant. And so one person feels the trunk and say, well, the elephant, they've never seen an animal elephant, so it must be like a snake. Another person feels the leg, and they say, well, it must be like a tree, a trunk, thick and heavy. Another feels the ear and says, well, it must be like a, a leather basket or something. Another person feels the tail, and at the end of the tail, it's hairy. So it must be like a small, fur, furry little mouse. And the king says, well, all of you guys, you guys are true in your own ways. So you don't need to argue about whether your way is the only way to see the elephant. But here's the thing. The only reason why the king could say that 
is because the king sees everything. And he sees the whole enchilada, or in this case, the whole elephant, and says, well, that's the elephant. But you see, he is making a truth claim. You could say it's like a snake, you could say it's like a tree trunk, you could say it's like a mouse, you could say it's like a leathery basket, and you're okay in your own blindness with that, but the truth is, the reason why I could kind of accept all these different blind men expressing this reality is because truth is, there is one single elephant. There is a universal claim. And what's so dangerous is that because they're not being honest about it, but they are imposing, to say that all religion is the same thing is to impose a Western, this is what New Begin says, and I get a lot from there, is one Western world view of what ultimate truth is. And what is that view? It's science. The scientific worldview is what the Western world says is the only way and the absolute way of knowing the world. And within that framework, every religion has their say, but cannot claim to be true. Some religion which can say to everybody should come to believe in this because obviously that's false. The only thing true is science. Now, a science is a very powerful way of knowing, for sure. It explains a lot. It helps us to develop these amazing technologies, everything over here. But to say that science is a good way to explain the world is very different from saying science is the ultimate reality and the absolute truth. It's a dangerous, false step. Science cannot say that. Uh, science says material. It's only about how materials react. And in that worldview, then, there is no space for spirit, consciousness, this experience that you're having of listening to these words and transforming these sounds into a meaning. And of course, because there's no sense of consciousness or a space for spirit, then there is no space for God. So do you see what pluralist ideology is saying? What he's saying is, there is no God. It's not a snake or a trunk, no. There's only this matter. Science explains everything. Um, even your consciousness is just an illusion. It's an, what they say, an epiphenomena, right? You make the action, and then there's a delayed understanding of what you did, and it just gives you false sense, and there's no real God. You're just trying to express your life in some ways that goes beyond your limited life experience. That's what pluralism as an ideology says. This one we have to uh, just be very honest about it. And for us uh, to know what the claim behind it is, to say all religions are the same, all religions are talking about the same thing, is to say that actually no religion has any truth claim. It's only a private affair. The only thing universal truth which we can talk about, really debate about, is science. But it's really science, truly, the universal, only, absolute way to know the world. So Thomas Kuhn, he's a physicist, a scientist, has studied the history of science, and he says this. Um, just listen very carefully to what he is saying. He says, observation and experience can and must drastically restrict the range of admissible scientific, he says, belief. He says, if we are scientists and we're honest, um, science is always progressing. And to say science is always progressing is to say that we are never at any moment know the absolute truth. So it is a belief system that this worldview, right, whether it be Copernican, right, or with Newtonian, now physics, Einsteinian, we always have this belief system that only looks at not, at, there's no way we can see everything. The only way science works is to say that we only are able to see certain things within our framework. That's what he's saying. But basically what he's saying is scientists, let's be honest. This is how we do it. So if we don't do that, else there will be no science. But they cannot alone determine a particular body of such belief. Again, you see the word here? I think it's very honest, and the honesty uh, brings about just humility. 
They cannot alone determine a particular body such belief. So just evidence alone doesn't move our knowledge. And apparently, okay, okay, this is a physicist, a scientist, a historian of science, Thomas Kuhn, in, a, in his book, uh, Scientific Revolution, he says, an apparently arbitrary element compounded of personal and historical accident is always a formative ingredient of the beliefs espoused by a given scientific community at a given time. Okay. Are you guys with me right now? Okay. The head is not hurting too much, right? And it's fun, huh? So he's saying, let's be honest, science too, we are saying science is progressing. We know more than last generation. That is to say then there's a historicity, right? not universal truth, but a historical, contextual, communal truth to science too. If you don't admit that, then you can't really do science. And we're going to come back to this quote. It's going to help us to see how, gospel, how, should we, how we should see the gospel. So science, Thomas is saying, let's be honest, we do not know everything. We cannot say we have the ultimate, absolute perspective in reality. Right? That, that's the first problem with pluralism as an ideology. Right? But the second thing is this. Actually, we Christians believe that the gospel is not a private affair, but a public truth. It does compete against the ultimate claim of science. It doesn't compete in the way science explains the world, okay? And sometimes we misunderstand that. So creationism, six days, or evolution, it takes billions of years, and we think that that's where a battle is. No, no, right? Uh, where the battle is, uh, the claim of ultimate reality. And we, have, again, we as Christians too, the gospel says, right, is that it is a public truth. And that's where the gospel does stand and confront Pluralism as an ideology. Is everybody following? So pluralism is a societal organization, no coercion of belief system. We are all accept. But pluralism is an ideology that there is an ultimate reality which science can only explain. We confront. And basically, as I said, science says it's all matter. You understand how the chemical reaction happens, then you could understand what is happening. It's all matter. There is no meaning. You could talk about how in science but you cannot talk about why in science, right? Why this creation? Why am I alive? Science says, oh, don't talk about that because there's no such thing. That's an ultimate claim against Christianity, which says, no, there is an ultimate claim. All this is God's loving purpose, and it's a confrontation at that point. And again, we Christians... It makes a faith statement on that one. But then so do the scientists too. How can the scientists say all this has no meaning? The only way the scientists can say that right, is if they see the whole world history from the beginning to the end. And after it is ended, then they say, see, there's no meaning. But then, of course, you know, for them, in that, in that scientific worldview, there will be no one there at the time to really see it. So they came and say, see, right? <laughs> there's a, both are making faith statements. But both are making statements about the ultimate reality. And so there's a confrontation there. Jesus, right? We just read from Mark, the very beginning of it. Notice how the story of Jesus happens. It happens uh, with the telling of the historical works of Jesus Christ. And right from there, we see that what the Gospels, what the apostles are claiming is that the story of Jesus happened, and it has universal claim. In other words, Jesus' story was not just made up. It starts right off with Isaiah and John the Baptist. It locates Jesus in a historical time. John the Baptist, uh, he was a real person. In fact, uh, Josephus, who was a Roman Jewish historian, writes of Joseph, I mean, uh, John the Baptist, independent of the gospel writers. And so in this true historical figure who has his own rippling historical influence, we see even in later in the book of Acts that John's disciples were there in Ephesus even before the Jesus message got there. So in this real historical figure that can be verified outside of the gospels, the gospel writer tells us it is in that historical stream that we see Jesus' story happening. 
Jesus truly walked on this earth. Now, in that historical event of Jesus, uh, they say an amazing thing happened. Uh, Jesus rose from the dead. And right there again, people who say, uh, well, all religions are all the same, they say, well, this is just like Greek mythology. But uh, one apologist, uh, C.S. Lewis, he says, those people who say it's Greek mythology have never read Greek mythology. No Greek mythology tells the story of resurrection like this. It's a continually rising and dying God. But here it says, Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. History. And on the third day, he rose. Again, like all historical evidences now, there's no foolproof thing, but we look at the historical implications of it, and then we see that, hey, something happened that changed the apostles who were afraid and hiding in the basement, and now they go all out. What happened? Well, they, for them, these people who were afraid of their own life, they saw that Jesus did rise, and now at that point in their historical experience, he could not, they could not deny it. N.T. Wright, um, we heard some of his teaching. N.T. Wright says he believes in the resurrection as a historian, because that's the only way you can express, explain what happened historically in the early church. And what the early church saw, right? you and I, right? uh, we saw Jesus die, in, buried in the tomb of Arimathea, and there he is alive. They can't explain this away, so the only way to exp- understand this phenomena is to say this Jesus who died three days ago is risen from the dead, and so now he's the son of God, as he says, because there's no one else who rose from the dead. Now, if he is the son of God, then he is revealing what the God of the universe is doing in the world. Okay. At that point, they realized that they're not just talking about a Jewish Messiah whose teaching should be continually expressed and taught to the Jewish people to inspire them, to give them hope against Roman oppression. They realize that Jesus rose from the dead. He is the Son of God, as he says. Then he is expressing the heart of the God who created this world. And so at that point, this was ultimate reality, truth. Okay, not everything, not exhaustive, but this is a truth claim. See, that is why they all became missionaries without any missionary program or agenda. All of them. It just, it was natural. If they know that this is the public truth, universal truth, and it answers the question that everybody's asking, in every corner of the earth, what is life for? And they know the answer, they cannot help but express it. It's interesting, I was uh, having lunch with a um, um, Buddhist monk professor in Duke University, and he says that Christianity is the only missionary religion. But the reason why it's missionary religion is because it just they recognized that what they were experiencing was not a cultural, simple, uh, just their nation thing, but it was a universal thing. And so here's the interesting thing. So we see Paul, right? Paul goes out, goes out every place to preach. But when Paul's writing to Rome, there's already Christians in Rome. Why is that? Was there another Paul that we never heard of? No. But because Christians, like you and me, just simple Christians who did business selling clothes, right, uh, making baskets, when they heard the story of Jesus, realized that this is a universal claim. It's not something I keep to myself and onto my community. I've got to tell everybody that the world was created by a loving God and that the loving God had come and became body, human being, and expressed his love towards us by even sacrificing that body. And then he has shown us that the love of God will renew everything by rising and defeating death. This was a universal claim, and they could not but help and share this. Everybody became a missionary when they recognized this truth. 
Pluralism and ideology says science matter. There's no such thing as spirit, God. Nothing, there's no meaning in life. And then the gospel says, no, there is meaning in life. God created, God created out of love. And God showed his love in Jesus Christ. And love will overcome. And that's a confrontation right there. If we accept pluralism as an ideology, then, then we have not become um, good citizens of the modern world, but we have accepted their claim. You have your religion, I have my religion, so we don't have to talk about it anymore. I just want us to understand what we're saying when we say that. Okay? Now, I'm not saying let's do the opposite, go and try to convert everybody, not coercion. But if we don't have the courage and the confidence and the freedom to be able to talk about what is more true, whether your religious claim or my religious claim, we are accepting what science is saying is all religion has no truth claim, there's only matter. I just want us to recognize that. That's why he says it's a missionary crisis. The, when the church has become less confident in gospel, what the church has done is basically accept the Western worldview that there's only matter and science is the only way to know it. Don't ask questions of purpose. You could talk about it. You can be passionate about it, like the way you like New York Mets, but don't think that's an important discussion in life. That's a confrontation. Okay, so then, um, how can we be more confident in the gospel? So today, what we're going to talk about is uh, more like how ourselves. So there's the confidence in the message and the confidence in the communication. Next week, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the confidence in communication. How should we be able to talk about truth claims in a plural society that says don't talk about truth claims unless it's science? Okay? So we're going to talk about that next week. And I, I believe that will be very practical. But even right here now, we're going to the practice. How can we in our individual lives become more confident in the message? And a couple of things, well, three things today, real quickly. Right? One is actually that uh, confidence that the message is true no matter what. Co building confidence by aligning our personal way of living, organizing, according to that reality. And the third, living it together as a community. Okay? So the first thing is this, right? Um, you have a, a claim, science, and you have a claim, a gospel. Um, we could rest very confidently on this gospel because, as I share with you, uh, it is something that the church had experienced 2,000 years ago and it has never looked back. Y you, you cannot explain what happened in Rome unless the gospel's claim is true. See, uh, the pluralist ideology is not something that's new, actually. Uh, the Roman Empire was a pluralist society, too. Um, and its ideology, for different reasons. So they said, you could worship all your own different gods, too. So Ephesus had their own god, and, and Athens had their own god. In fact, when Paul went to Athens, uh, there's this interesting event, um, and this passage we're going to look more carefully next week, is that when he goes there, they, he sees a place where there's statues to many different gods. So it, it, it was a pluralist society like ours. And they even had a statue called the unknown god, just in case they miss a god. So they wanted to be kind of equal to everybody. Right? But in that society, right, Roman Empire, uh, why did they let everybody worship their own God? Uh, for political reasons. They said, you worship your own God as long as you keep it private. And publicly, you declare your allegiance to the emperor. So even in Jerusalem, who, was, who were vehemently monotheistic, but their monotheism limited to their culture and nation, even there, they said they asked the priest to make sacrifices and pray to the emperor. And 
They said, we'll agree to that as long as you don't bring any statue of it. No, we're fine with that. Uh, for political reasons, the Roman Empire said, you guys worship your own gods uh, as long as you give allegiance to the empire, to the prayer to the emperor. Church began to proclaim the gospel in that milieu. And they weren't attacking the Roman Empire directly, but the Roman Empire got worried because they also knew exactly what these guys were doing. In fact, the word, uh, again, the gospel, right? The word gospel itself says proclamation of public truth. Uh, the Roman uh, marketing would say the gospel of the emperor, the public proclamation of the emperor. And against that, the apostle said the gospel, as you read today, of Jesus Christ. And they realized that these guys were confronting it. And so although Paul and Peter says, you should respect the rules above you, so it was, they weren't like anti-establishment. Yet the emperor uh, shook in fear because they were making another ultimate claim. But Roman Empire has collapsed and they're in the history books and the church is still here. So the, the gospel... The message is something that we can be confident about. It has been tested. Okay? So we don't have to build our own confidence because there's no power in the message. There's already power in the message whether we are confident or not. Okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing is this. Now how do we build this uh, subjective my experiential confidence in this message that has already proven itself to be true and tested and has overcome uh, by aligning the way we organize our lives to that reality. And that's where most of us as Christians, and I'm looking at my own life first, we lack the confidence in the gospel that has already proved itself to be true because we don't align our lives daily to that reality. All truth, right, all truth claims need the subject to be committed to it. There's a personal commitment to all sorts of truth, every subject of truth, even science. Okay? Um, it's not just religious truth, but even scientific truth needs personal commitment. Right? Just even uh, the beginning of this, uh, in the 1900s, most people didn't believe that the uh, the earth moved, the plate tectonics, right? Uh, but the scientist who came and said, no, it does move, had to at first personally commit himself to that theory. All the other scientists ridiculed and laughed him because look, it's not moving. But he had to personally commit himself and then all of his life, he had to look for those data that will support his theory. It was a risk, it was a personal commitment. But that needed to be made to get to the truth. So again, uh, with Thomas Kuhn, right? He says this, right? Compound of personal and historical accent. To, to expand that scientific knowledge, he has a compound of personal and historical accent. You, people, even in scientific truth, need to make a personal commitment. Here is a Peter Munro. He's a, a, he, he's a, he studies fishery in the Pacific Ocean, and himself is a poet. And he says this too in an in a interview. He says, everybody still has to live by faith. Every scientist has to live by faith. Maybe scientists more than anybody else. Because the one thing that we are certain of in the sciences, so he's talking as a scientist now, is that we don't know. We are constantly posting models as explanations of how things work. So he says, even as scientists, we have to have faith. And when we feel like this could explain things better, then I have to have a personal commitment to it. If, if science needs a personal commitment, then so does our gospel truth too. We need to live our life as if the ultimate truth claim of the gospel that this is love, 
God created out of love, and that we find God in Christ, in receiving that love and in giving that love. Now we have to live our life by that. But the thing is, most of us, we get pulled, we get scheduled, we get directed by the pluralist ideology and scientific claim. There's only this world, be successful, materials, and that's your joy. And we get pulled by it, and because we just completely live by that, we think this is true. We think that the earth is just one solid earth, earth, right, matter, and it does not move. But there's a fire of love that's moving everything in this earth. And the only way for us to have the confidence is to live our lives by it. It takes personal commitment. Now, one of the simplest ways to do it is this, and this is what I've been sharing with you, um, is to daily read the story of God and to pray. You and I cannot give personal commitment to the reality of God revealed in Jesus if we don't do this on a daily basis. Because if we're not organizing our life by the way Christ organized his life, then our life is being organized by the world. Um, so uh, praying morning, noon, and evening. And this is something, again, I, I showed, shared with you several times, right? Um, it's, it was done by Jesus. It's an old Jewish practice. And now there's a renewal of it. And um, they came out with a book, and it's a movement. It's called Common Prayer, Pocket Edition. And I will post it up in the city. And it's a liturgy for ordinary radicals. Uh, saying that you know, this type of lifestyle is not for the saints who are different from your lay Christian, ordinary Christian speech, for every one of us. And I just want to read one part of it. The reason why I believe that, and obviously these people who are part of this movement believe that praying, uh, where you break your days by prayer hours, is the way for us to personally commit to the reality of God is this here. The church calendar does not help us remember our appointments. Before this, they say everyone, every nation has their own calendar system, right? And that's how they organize and control people. But the church calendar, what we're doing right now, does not help us remember appointments, but it helps us remember who we are. It aims at nothing less than changing the way we experience time and perceive reality. It is about the movement of history toward a glorious goal, God's kingdom on earth, as it is in heaven. Okay. So we're not doing daily disciplines because uh, we have to get points. Right? We're doing daily disciplines because we want to remember the ultimate reality revealed by Christ and we want to be personally committed to it. So um, I know so many of you guys are already trying it um, and I, I, I encourage you guys to continue to do it. If you have not, do it at least for a month it takes a while for our worldview to change a long time. And see if it doesn't help you to see uh, the way you experience daily life in a different way. So this is the second thing. Right? The message itself has been tested. Uh, we build that confidence by being personally committed. And the third thing is this. Uh, we need to practice this reality as a community. Um, Again, here, uh, just quoting Thomas Kuhn, right? He says uh, about how that they cannot alone, again, the evidence they cannot alone uh, determine a particular body of such belief. What needs is compounded or personal, as I said, historical accident, and always a formative ingredient of beliefs espoused by a given scientific community at a given time. A, a scientific community, a fellow scientist has to come together and say, you know what, we believe with you, and we're going to do this together. Even science the way they advance the knowledge is that they need a community. In fact, one scientist was said that uh, uh, for new theory to really become valid, the old scientists with old theories, they gotta die first. <laughs> That's the only way to go about it. Again, here's a scientist just being honest about the whole scientific progress. Even science needs a community. If we are going to truly believe and express confidently about the reality that is revealed in God, uh, you and I have to practice it and personalize, but we also have to continue to meet and gather together, like this, this gathering. Uh, 
Think about where else would you hear about the ultimate reality being the love of God. We need community. In fact, we need more than just one gathering, and that is why uh, we try to do life groups before on Fridays, and we're trying to see what will work best. Uh, the next one here that we're trying to do on Wednesdays, um, I know your life, uh, families, your children, all that uh, means that maybe not all of you guys can truly join in every week. If you can, please do. It's going to be here starting this Wednesday from 7 to 8.15. Um, if you have families, maybe you guys could tag team and come. Uh, we are trying to remember as a community the reality of God. And the confidence of the proclamation comes when we gather more frequently. And what we're going to do at Wednesday, uh, this starting this Wednesday, is this. We, we are going to do some of the prayers that's here. And the prayers here, some of them are like 1,000 years old. And as I said, this is a movement. It's being done by many different Christians. And all of that, I think that's so powerful, isn't it? We're joining a Christian community like us who believes in the reality of God's love. Um, and we're going to be also reading scripture. Um, after the sermon series is over, next week, we're going to go back to the book of Ephesians. But what we want to do is, during Wednesdays, I want to just read the book of Ephesians together. Um, and I think that's going to be even more fun, just sitting down and just reading through the book of Ephesians, uh, the way the first people who heard that uh, heard it as a whole letter. When we gather together, that's where the confidence also builds. Um, again, lesson you begin. Uh, he says this. Um, the message about uh, the God who became flesh, the crucified Savior, resurrection, new creation. How will this be credible to those who have been mentally trained and conditioned to believe that the real world is a world which can be explained and managed without the hypothesis of God. Right? How are you going to convince them? Right? Uh, you and I are constantly conditioned and trained that we don't need God to explain the world. How are you going to convince them about crucifying, saving, all that? He says, there's only one clue to the answering of that question that I know of. Only one hermeneutic to the gospel. The congregation that believes it. The congregation that believes it. When people gather together and they really believe and they organize their whole life around it, right, the way they love and the way they forgive, then people will turn and say, whoa, this must be truth. This must be the ultimate reality. He says this not as someone as a thinker, but also experienced in India, right? There was a church that truly lived by the love of God that drew other people in. That is what all churches are trying to strive for. And that is what new life, my friends, we're striving for. Um, I want us to be fully in to this reality of God in our daily walks and in our life together and to be grounded, to be directed by that reality. And people, we will do have to do our part, but people will come. And people will not be just attracted by, oh, here is a very uh, fun place and uh, there's good sounds. And, no, people will be drawn and be 